Yeah. When I have opinions about Trump, people say, oh, you're just, you're being negative. You know, you're letting hate control yourself. This is what my own mom says about this whenever I have these opinions about Trump. And it's not. Um, this is how you tell you're in hell. Um, when people are easily distracted by s stupidity, common sense is being ignored. Um, they just choose, um, they're distracted by the emotion. They don't, they're so distracted by their emotion that they don't even let it enter their brain that they're actually not even thinking. And that is the case. Um, and whenever I compare Trump to Hitler, I have it for good reason. It's not to say that these are just two, I just take one bad person and I, and I make the other one look like he's bad. I have basis in it. Um, when Hitler took power, um, he had, he had to make the German people feel like they were worthy of praise. And he did this by trying to uphold, um, to, to raise the level of how they saw themselves, uh, to try to make them feel good about themselves. And he used whatever he could find around him, uh, any kind of things that they believed in, other things they believed in, to, to uplift them. And um, some of the things they claim that he used is he used um, Darwin, uh, Darwin, thoughts of Darwin at the time, because Darwinian thoughts were really kind of prevalent, uh, really popular. So he said, okay, if I can find some something, um, if I can use Darwinism uh, to uplift uh, them, I, that would be one thing that I could do. And so he said, you know, we're superior, us Germans, we come from a superior race and we, I found these pot sherds in the soil and uh, they're like from our past or whatever, you know. He found through using, trying to say that they were related to some Aryan race. He created an Aryan race and then he said, these are a perfect people and we are um, direct genetically related to these people and these people, you know, because we're related to them, we must be the superior master race. And so that was one thing he used. He used something like, I had heard he used the Knights of the Round Table um, the stories of the Knights of the Round Table to kind of justify them. He put, what he did is he created a whole culture to kind of uphold um, their perception about themselves so that they would feel good about them. These are the exact same things that people who support Trump think about Trump is that Trump makes them feel good about themselves. That's the reason why they like Trump is because he makes them feel good about themselves. You know, that's kind of a narcissistic uh, way of thinking about things. It's, um, you know, it's like you're looking in a mirror and he's providing you the image of yourself that you want to see. And so he paints this picture that you're all really nice and everything like that. And he won't tell you anything bad about yourself. Um, he won't let you know that we're, um, that in China, we're not giving Chinese workers the same rights as we do as we do in America and um, that the corporations don't and they don't pay them as much as they do Americans and that's obvious and for those reasons we will never be able to compete with them and there will never be a fair um, th there will never be a fair marketplace we have to give them the same rights we do we have to give them the, the same kind of money we also have to give them guns because if they don't have guns, they're never going to be able to overthrow that communistic government that we're fearful of in, uh, in China. Um, they will always have control and the people in China are doing the same thing to their own people as, as Trump is doing to our people that Hitler was doing to his people. He's making, giving them, uh, a sense of great national pride. He's trying to use their national pride, trying to make them feel good about themselves to distract them from actually using their brain to actually solving problems. It's you pander to emotion and the motion will help you 
hijack the brain. Uh, um, and this is kind of just how you control people whenever you are afraid that they're going to scapegoat you. Um, is because when you're controlling a nation or you're controlling anybody, um, they're going to look at you as a part of their problem unless you can distract them from seeing, you know, that you're the problem that you try to you try to direct them in in a different direction and you say this is our problem you know you try to point out the evil in the world and then get them distracted on that while you can also probably on the back end fix the problems or or just kind of do whatever the heck you want which is um, kind of kind of what every um, every time we vote somebody into uh, into our country you know to control our country every time we get a president uh, usually the case is if it's a Republican they always find something that is evil in the world and they get everybody distracted in going after that and it's a great tactic because it permits them to diffuse any of the concern for their for what they're doing um, and focus on something else while they are off trying to do other things that they see as more of a problem that the people won't ever understand or you know things of that nature and so Trump is kind of just a hood ornament and uh, I think the smarter conservatives realize this and and um, use the fact that we don't like Trump or the liberals don't like Trump um, to distract us from actually even getting involved in the other things that are going on on the back end that have nothing to do with whatever Trump is doing on the forefront and Trump is acting crazy and the reason why he acts crazy why he does like all this show and and like picks on people and stuff like that is to distract people um, is to distract the country distract the people from actually solving problems or actually being concerned about the right things they're more concerned about um, you know, people just in general don't aren't very good at at knowing exactly what should be going on in their country. They're more concerned about finding other people as the evil. Um, if we can't come together and actually discuss the things that are necessary to fix things in the country or fix things in the world, and we have to do this all around the world. It's not just Americans. It's everybody. We all have to agree on this. Um, the corporations are just going to are just going to abuse all of our nations. the The problem is, and um, it's not pro government and it's not pro corporation. It's both. It's pro organize uh, any organization that's too big um, is bad. Those are monopolies. Um, a government that you give all your money to. And controls everything is a monopoly in a sense um, and that's kind of what China is is because it's a government that has control of all these companies and all the and is actually controlling them and controlling the people and trying to maintain a kind of a working system that permits them to prevent the people from actually getting any actual um, freedom and the people don't have the freedom. This is the reason why they need guns. The reason why we needed guns in the first place in our country was because of that. We needed to have control of the country. We needed to overthrow any of the governments that might come into the country and take us over. That's the reason, that's why our democracy works in the first place, is that we have, we are able to make the government fear us. We're able to make other governments fear us. And um, and so they don't come in, try to control or overpower us. And so we have guns. We need to give guns to other nations and we need to give them logical guns. We need to give them, um, you know, give them just ideas, you know, basically ideas that will empower them. Um, Christianity is chock full of ideas that would empower people. Um, but the problem is, is that, um, 
people focus on only the things that make them feel good about themselves. They don't usually think about the stuff that actually would Im improve our whole world uh, situation. When Jesus came to the earth, he really was not here to, um, uh, to kind of create a kingdom on earth. Right? He wasn't here to overthrow the governments. He was here to change the culture, the way pe people treat each other. And uh, in general, our political systems and all that stuff, it, he says, you know, that don't, you're not supposed to be against um, the people in power. Um, you're supposed to, um, you're supposed to pray for them and hope that they're able to control things. We're not going to be able to do that, but I mean, we're not going to be able to control what they do. Um, but we need to be concerned about the people that get in there, you know, to judge a man by his, by his fruits, um, by his fruits, you will know him. And, uh, it is, that's judging people's not the problem. Uh, that judging, when you judge someone, you know, the, what it's talking about in the Bible is it's talking about judging internally, saying somebody's never going to be able to change. Um, I think Trump is not going to change because he doesn't apologize. And so until he apologizes, I won't have a different opinion about Trump. That doesn't mean that he can't change. That means that he just doesn't seem to want to change. And so that's not the same as judging him eternally. I'm actually saying to him, until you do this, I won't believe that you're actually changing. And um, he just, he takes on the attribute of being a bully. And what bullies do is they basically get all the other bullies or people who have this attribute of themselves that try to find some other people uh, that have, um, that are more of the problem than they are and they put them into groups and they and they throw stuff at them and they and they put a name on them and it makes them feel good about themselves because they're elevating themselves based upon um all the things they're not which is that group over there um trump's own father said uh well trump had a had a sibling who um i think his name was frank and he said don't be like Frank was basically all his father said about him. Frank uh, just doesn't have a good self-perception. You need to stay away from Frank. Just don't be like Frank. And through all of Trump's life, his whole life, he was justifying himself by not being like a weak brother that he had or his perceived perception that this was a weak brother. And it was because his father had painted this picture of of his sibling and he found that he could control people they his um well he became hard to control his father couldn't control trump so he sent him to military school and at military school i think what ha trump learned is that he could um that he could be really successful at controlling people by learning tools of manipulation and those are the things and part of those are just bullying people you know, if you can bully people, then you can get people to feel good about themselves by bullying another set of people. And then you're able to control and maintain order because the people that are working with you, if they do anything that's against what you're trying to do, then you'll turn around, and bully them. And then you end up in the camp that um, is with all the fools and people that that you're painting a picture of. So that's kind of mil that's how you maintain a military control, um, how you create a large military force. Probably the reason why a lot of the governments that have large military forces are this way is because um, they find somebody to vilify and they put them off in a separate camp and they say, if you're not with me, you're with those people over there. And those people are complete idiots, you know, and, uh, the solution to the problem is not to let the, your emotion overpower what your brain is thinking. You know, um, don't get it. The reason why terrorism is so effective is because, um, when you're, you're terrified, um, the terror, the terrorism response, the emotional response to being terrified 
it overpowers your ability to actually make rational um, decisions about how to spend your time. If uh, some terrorists can cut off the heads of 15 people, that's going to permit you to go out and go out on a limb and throw 3,000 people at this, you know, throw uh, a million people at this, and, you know, 3,000 of those people are going to die, all because you were terrified by these guys beheading 15 people. That's the, that's the effect, that's the reason why terrorism is effective, is because we are, we can be overpowered by emotion. And um, feeling good about ourselves is another is another tactic. Anytime that's Satan. If you're um, if you don't believe in Satan, just keep in mind that Satan, the idea of Satan, all it is about is it's about letting um, being easily distracted. If you if one of the fruits of the spirit, uh, the Christian spirit, one of the fruits of the Christian spirit is that um, you have self-control and part of self-control is not being distracted and if you're easily distracted and i'm easily distracted i think everybody is but if you're easily distracted and you justify kind of your whole your whole way of life and everything based upon emotion and on things that have nothing to do with logic um if you're not really thinking, if you're if you're letting the emotions overpower you, then you're not going to be able to deal with actual problems that that are in the world. And um, an example is um, people f often have this problem that we don't um, people don't get paid well, you know. And uh, there are people out there that are looking to save lots of money. And when you're saving lots of money, there are people who are controlled by money, corporations that, that worship money, they love money. And by loving money, um, they realize that they, they can make more money if they can convince the people that are trying to save money that they can find cheaper things. And so what that translates to is offloading costs called negative externalities. They push the costs of um, the products that they're selling off on the people that are trying to make the products for them. So the, the people they hire. So they actually will pay people less, offload lots of policy on them. Say you, you're, you're supposed to treat the customer like they're the best thing since sliced bread and do all these fantastic things. Do all this stuff and um, you'll have a job, but if you don't do this, then we're, you're, you're going to be, we're going to kick you out the door, you know. And so the people are so over, they're enslaved to these people that are then trying to provide a cheaper product. So they're cutting back all the margins so they can create, create a greater profit margin. And then they sell items that are lower than competitors, it does the competitors out of business because they can't compete with this because it's unfair what they're doing. They're doing it to their own people. It's unfair what they're doing to the people that are working for them. But at the same time, they're trying to create this unreal expectation that they're able to maintain uh, a world where you'll be able to buy products that are cheaper. Um, then what this translates to is that you can't do this here in America, then you have to push it overseas and you have to do it to peoples in other countries. You have to pay them less, give them less rights so that you can have greater margins of profit. You offload your, you offload your costs on the people that are in the other country so you can create greater margins. And, and the thing is, is that everybody has to compete this way. There are all the other country, uh, Companies have to do the same thing because you're doing something unfair. It's like they're all, we're all in a kind of Olympic, you know, like the the cyclists that are doping and, and taking drugs and things like that. Um, they have to do that in order to compete. And so it's just unfair all the way around. And it all comes, it's always a result of this intense desire to save money. And the thing that's if you're rich and you have money to spend, you're wasting time to save money, then your idea of trickle down 
um, economy doesn't really work because you're not actually just spending money to save time because time is not a renewable resource. Money is. I mean, you could always make more money. You can't make more time. You'll always have the same amount of time no matter what, and it's going to decrease. And as if you go and you try to go across town to save some money, guess what that says politically about you to your family? It says you are a cheap person. You do not care about your family. You will not save time to spend time with your family to, um, to uh, spend money on, you know, pay other people like, um, you know, click list or, um, I mean, I, I work in the grocery industry. And so, you know, you've got your Instacart, you got your shift, you got your click list, those guys, you can have your caterers, you could have, you could put your money on those guys to go out and get the food and, um, and make it for you. And you can sit at home with the kids, spend the time there and not have to be out looking for better prices or any of that stuff. You just leave it to somebody else. And the more money you throw at them, they can either decide whether it makes sense for them to try to save money or to try to save time. And they're going to, they're going to err on the side of time because they want to get um, you feeling like you're going to be able to keep using them and it's going to be efficient for them. And so the thing is, is if you're rich, spend your money. Don't mess with trying to save time. Uh, I mean, not save time, not save money. Um, don't spend your time trying to save money. You're rich. You're rich for a reason. It's probably, it may be because you're, you're saving a lot of money, but um, when you hoard money for yourself, as it says in the Bible, you hoarded money for yourself, it is not good because people die off. It's like saying, um, it's like saying that I'm the only important person in the body. Nobody else is. And so things die off and eventually the body isn't there anymore. Um, that's the same idea is, is that you need, money needs to circulate. If it doesn't circulate, I mean, it's like blood. If it doesn't circulate, then things die off. And, uh, the way our government deals with the lack of circulation of money is, um, they, they float our dollar. They increase the supply of, um, of, of currency uh, and they decrease it and they control that in order to float our dollar to try to keep the dollar at a certain value, you know, um, based upon whether it increases or, or, you know, it fluctuates in price. A Bitcoin fluctuates in price, but the reason why it fluctuates in price so violently is because um, there is, there isn't a, a good perception of value in our world. And, um, and nobody can control the value of Bitcoin. And so if it's fluctuating all over the place and our dollar is not doing it, the reason why is because the government's controlling the currency. They're controlling the circulation. They're trying to control the value. They're trying to make it steady. Um, but they can't do that with Bitcoin. Bitcoin, uh, nobody can control Bitcoin. Um, you, can, you can do a trillion dollar deal with Bitcoin and um and and do it without lawyers and actually just do the transaction instantly and the governments hate that because it means that they can't track um really big things going on in the world and so another thing they do with currency is being able to track the the where it's going who it's who's doing the transactions being able to track actual criminal things that are going on in the world and, um, but the, but the thing is, is that Bitcoin's out, uh, nobody can, nobody can control it, uh, Bitcoin, how it works. Um, the, even the mathematicians have agreed that it's completely perfect. There's no way to, to control it. And the people who are smart know that they can't control it. And the governments also know they can't control it. And it's based on encryption and encryption is at such a high bit degree of the encryption is so high that it, you would not be able to
create a computer that in any likely amount of time could decrypt messages that were encrypted. So for that reason, no government can, can eavesdrop on anybody's communications. There's so many things in play here that just require actual thought and people don't have the time to really deal with it. You have to kind of offload it on to the government, you have to on, offload it onto other people, and then you kind of have to just agree that there's a possibility that whenever you're picking a candidate, there might be more um, at work going on in trying to control the the things around you and just making a simple um, making a simple judgment won't be so easy. Um, but I can say for certain that um, there's lots of evidence of things that have gone wrong in the past that um, we got so much baggage and, um, and we are at a, we're kind of in an analysis paralysis state. Well, analysis paralysis is when you spend so t much time analyzing that you're, you can't really do anything. Um, you're afraid to, that you're going to do the things that you did bad in the past. Um, and it's going to prevent you from doing, uh, from making any choices in the future. And that's reason why conservatives tend to be really kind of afraid to make any like real change in anything. They tend to go by the book is because um, they're afraid, uh, because they're trying to analyze the situation and not being able to make sense of it. Um, whenever there's drastic change, that's when making changes are necessary because eventually you're going to happen upon a success. And change is not, um, change is not, um, there's a word and I'm, I keep forgetting it, you know, um, it's success, but you know, change is not success. Success is necessary. Sex, sex, success is a subset of change, but change is a superset of, of everything that needs to go on. And conservatism is taking what worked in the past and trying to make decisions, uh, and use that to control decisions that are made. And <clears throat> there's so many things that, um, that evil people can do in our world. And, um, they're, the thing is, is to try to keep us from seeing what's really evil. And we end up voting people into our governments who are really on the back end, probably working with the evil people to distract us from them so that we're focusing on something else that has nothing to do with what's going wrong in the world. And uh, so that's just, that's just, there's so much things that, that you could get into and talk about. Um, so that you could go one way, you could either be really controlled by your emotion or you could go another way and start trying to analyze the situation to a great degree. You kind of have to do both at the same time. Um, you have to have a balance of the two. And uh, so you, you, do, you realize there's something going on that's wrong, but you don't know what. And if you really knew what, then um, what exactly is going on wrong? I mean, we all have to kind of battle it. But um, I, think, I think the thing is to realize is that we can't really look at ourselves and say that we're good. And it says in the Bible that nobody's good, only God's good. So um, we can't look in the mirror and say, um, I like this person. Um, we have to say that every day. We have to kind of, you know, pre present a, a good image, you know, a smile. And, you know, we don't want to bring everybody down. But the reality is, is that we can't ever be complacent anymore. Not in this world. We can't be complacent. We can't sit and just have the same kind of family life and kind of the, this this whole perception that nothing's wrong 
um, it's not going to last very much longer. We've been told that all along. We don't want to think that. Um, we, we think God's going to take care of it for us. There are times in the Bible when God said, I'm going to give all these Israelites into their enemies, and then their enemies going to have control over them for, for 20 years, and then they're going to come back around and come to realization that they're doing a lot of bad stuff, and it's the reason why I let them into it, and then they're going to come back to me. And so there are a lot of Christians in our world that, are, that, that think that they're doing, uh, they're doing the Jesus thing, and the thing they don't realize is that they're not really thinking about what they're reading in the Bible. They're not. They're take. They're picking and choosing what it is they want to believe, um, picking things that will support their lifestyle, and then they're disregarding all the rest. And um, they're just choosing, you know, to see one thing and not really um, assessing how they could be better in how they treat, say, the homeless people don't understand that the reason why the homeless are on the streets um, around them is because um, when you're homeless um, and you go to a homeless shelter and I got this from Invisible People by Mark Horvath um, he said that um, in his broadcasts if you watch enough of them this is what the poor people say or the homeless people say um, is that there's they don't want to go to to a shelter, and the reason why you don't want to go to the shelter is there's no walls. Um, everybody in that shelter is in the same in the same predicament as you. They all see each other as part of the solution, uh, and that and when you're in the shelter, you're accessible, you're contained, you're accessible. If you fall asleep, you will have people going through your pockets looking for anything you have. And it'll be taken from you so there's nothing you can keep and so the way they fix this problem is logical you stay in a place where there's lots of people happening by and where nobody can do anything criminal and so you're on the streets on on the sidewalk sitting there maybe asking for money but maybe not even doing that it's just people are giving you money because they feel bad for you but then at the same time they're kind of self-conscious about themselves and they say, well, you know, I'm, I really could be doing something for the poor. And then you feel bad. You're driven by your emotion. And you don't feel so good about yourself. That's probably a good thing. But the thing is, is they're there because there's so many people happening by that no kind of criminal stuff can happen to them. If they have more security on the streets, on the sidewalk, than they do in a shelter. That's the reason why they're out there. And then the policemen come by, and the policemen get mad at these homeless people because they're um, they're disrupting the environment. They're you know they're causing problems with the businesses, and you know they're out there begging for money and stuff like that. It may not even be the case. Uh, some people, some of these people, they don't even beg for money. They sit in their cars, and they're trying to just trying to have some solid life of something that they can have so that they can go out and get work because part of of what of getting work is is that you have um you have residence and um you can't have residents be homeless it's it, it doesn't make any sense and so to have to to have residents you have to have a home you have to have low-income housing we need to invest in low-income housing. We need to put money into the government to create projects. You know, what they did in the past. Create large large hotel, like, like lots of apartments that are for low-income people so that they can go in, find a place of residence, then go out and get work. You see? And now we're not doing that. And... And on top of that, we've taken like all of the insane institutions and we got rid of them because they were kind of like trying to make money off of um, like what they do with nursing homes. They're like giving lots of um, drugs to the people, keeping them to c control them, you know, because um, some of the people there actually belong there. Um, they they have dementia and they want to get out of the institution. They cause a lot of trouble for the caregivers, so they just keep them drugged up. And that happened with the mental institutions, but the thing is, is eventually the government probably saw it was just too costly to do this, and so they got rid of, like, all of these institutions, or, you know, they got rid of it. 
and now we have insane people on the streets, that's not so bad because people got Bluetooth headsets that kind of make the insane people look, this is something I like to tell people and it gets everybody laughing is that, you know, it's perfectly okay now to be a schizophrenic in the world because if you're talking to yourself, people just assume you're talking on your Bluetooth headset. And so, and people laugh and it's, it's true. It's true. That's what's happening. You know. So, um, so sometimes I'll talk to myself if I'm trying to spread truth. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to out loud and I'll just spread all of, of my ideas, my ideals and things like that. And I'll know that people also have this perception that people who talk to themselves are talking on a Bluetooth headset. So I just, you know, I say, I could be talking to you. You wouldn't even know, you know, it says in the Bible to him who has ears, let him hear. Um, you could read from the Bible. You could be sitting there dictating everything you got off of your uh, off of your headset saying it in the world and people assume you're talking to your Bluetooth headset and you know That's a good way. That's that's a way of making something good by actually spreading information in a way that um, The people are not going to come back and say well, you're you're um, That you can't say this in an open space and now anybody can say anything they want to in an open space and nobody can tell who's on a Bluetooth headset so um, I just like putting out great ideas out there, tactical ideas. I like putting out, um, ideas that, um, just give people all the tools by which to actually make, um, decisions. Um, and some of them, my ideas are supported by documentaries. I don't really like to read books. And the reason why is because if I read like a page or two in a book, I eventually fall asleep. So I can't, I can't follow that stuff. It's more exciting to watch something in a documentary where somebody is presenting information. But I do know that people who make documentaries use tactics of the, I took, I took a, a thing in college called, a, a course in college called Gorilla Video Editing. I just needed it for video editing because I was taking a computer science degree and I had a minor in math, or not minor math, minor in art. And part of my minor in art was I needed to have a certain amount of art classes. And one of them was, just happens to be guerrilla video editing. And I was like, what's guerrilla video editing? And what they do is they teach you how to basically do what Michael Moore does with movies. And that is manipulate context, manipulate audio and video context in such a way as to, um, to get ideas into people's heads that have no basis in reality. And um, you can do that, if you watch through a Michael Moore documentary, you'll see this. And this is, I love watching his documentaries, but I have to keep telling myself, the stuff that he puts in there don't make any sense. He takes the audio track of somebody else and sticks it with the video track of another person, and then you mix them the two together, and you think that there's a certain idea being presented that really these two people don't even know each other and they're and you're coming to a, a, a result that is what Michael wants you to think but he hasn't done enough research to really actually be able to prove the things that he's want he's just trying to get people driven in direction it might be good what he's trying to do but he's do he's telling he's creating some false false information in people's minds in order to drive them in that direction is probably the reason why a lot of people believe that the things that we do it that we see in the news is all lies um part of the reason why that is is because um the newsmakers make their money off of advertisers and it used to be before fox television cnn would only um they would have the same news every hour for the entire day it was completely boring and then when Fox came along, the guys at CNN said, hey, that's the way you do it. That's the, um, that's the way you do it. Money for nothing and your chicks for free. That ain't working. That's the way you do it. So what they did is they basically, Fox said, you make it entertaining. You do like the tabloids do. You make things entertaining. You, um, you fill it with opinion. And uh, you, you, you give them the news, but then you add something to it that makes it entertaining. It makes people feel good about themselves, so they feel like they just want to keep watching it. 
and then they're there and you know on the back end you're selling them as a commodity to your advertiser you're saying to your advertisers this is what what kind of audience do you want you want the christian conservative capitalist conservative crowd uh we're fox and we can provide that to you um if you advertise on our on our broadcast on our system you will get that market and this market believes these certain certain things and they probably put all that stuff out there if they don't put it um outright in their in their materials they're saying it at at parties you know when people are trying to decide whether or not they want to put their stuff on their on their news system um they're saying hey you know if you really want this market you can do this and but you know you could do the same thing with cnn um but do it with other things that you own uh, other um and you could do it with cnn when it you know and you could cover both bases and make money on both of those parties even though they hate each other um you could make lots of money everywhere because money has money <laughs> Love, no, they say love knows no boundaries. Actually, money knows no boundaries. Um, um, if you got money, uh, it makes more sense for you to make money. To <clears throat> not, not put all your eggs in one basket, to put them on all the baskets. That's what, that's the reason why people have um, distributed, um, why they have all these portfolios and they try to keep everything distributed a level is so that if they lose in some area, they gain great in one, so it keeps them balanced. But, um, anyhow, I, if you if, if you watch me, you will learn of all these ideas that exist. Um, and I get them from documentaries. But the thing is, is that if you're rich and you believe in trickle-down economy, stop trying to save money Stop trying to waste time to save money. Save time, waste money. Okay, um, it's fine. You're rich. You're always you're you're always going to be able to make money. So why sit there and try to hoard it? Um, to the people who are concerned about their retirement, um, it's it good reason to get into four hundred one k. But the thing is, is that um, when you retire, people who know, know this, who retire, um, a year after that, you realize you have to go out and work again, because if you sit at home and do nothing, um, you fall into a thing called a sedentary lifestyle, which is actually deadly. Um, you will sit around and you'll get swelling in your legs. You'll be fat. You won't be exercising. You won't be moving around. You won't feel good about yourself. You won't be having friends. You won't be, because you have more friends when you're working, and when you're not working, you're not having friends, so you have to go out and do voluntary work. And so that's the reality, is that if you're not working, you're going to be doing some kind of work. You can't sit around and do nothing for the rest of your life. I know this for a fact because I led something called a, um, and I really didn't even know I was doing this, and it's called a victim of circumstance living off your parents um, I'm doing that to some degree my my father passed away and left me some money uh, through a trust and that's how I that's how I'm able to to exist in the world um, and I figure the way I would give back is by kind of spreading kind of the things that I've learned while I was kind of living a sedentary lifestyle um, now that I, I work, but I'm not that much of a happy worker, um, mainly because I'm not doing, I'm not doing things that actually cause any change in the world. And that's the reason why I'm putting my video up on YouTube is just because I'm thinking maybe somehow somebody might actually watch it and, and learn from it. Um, but there is a, there's a part of my psyche that's getting hijacked and I'm starting to think that. I'm actually in hell and um, that from living so long in that sedentary lifestyle that God's given up on, on me and I'm in a parallel reality where the whole where it's basically this whole world that I'm in right now is my own personal hell and it it can get 
you know, and so this is really kind of message in a bottle, kind of like the police, you know, putting out that message bottle and trying to see if there's actual life out there. Um, people actually thinking about these things and not being so, you know, because it seems like anything, any information I put out, people just don't come back and say, oh, yeah, I saw that or I, I. You don't see that. It, it, seem, it seems like everybody's really distracted. And either everybody's really distracted and they're not really going and pursuing truth and they're distracted by themselves or this whole world is make-believe. And I am the only person in this world that's actually thinking. Um, the rest of it is, is a figment of the imagination. And if you think that is a problem, then think this about other people who might actually be experiencing the same thing even if it isn't the truth if they're experiencing the same thing then they're not going to feel like doing anything is going to have that that anything they do anything they say to people not having any effect not having any direct feedback is going to make them feel like the world doesn't exist and um it's probably what the punk rockers felt like in the Blondie and them and the, the documentary um, Rock and Roll. I know, I know I tend to go off on changes, but um, they said that they were, um, they were rejecting all the plasticness of the world. And that's what drove them to be punk rockers. So they wanted to get on stage, spread out all the things that were bugging them. And um, so that people would search for some social change. And so whenever people don't, res when, when there are great evils in the world and nobody's out doing anything to fix them and people are not really, people are kind of in themselves and not really trying to deal with problems, then what tends to happen is, is it tends to increase the amount of um, kind of dissent or it, it, it increases the tension and makes people much more at each other's throats. You can't maintain any kind of polit political correctness, any kind of civility with that going on. And the only way you can maintain civility is, is to like actually try to solve problems be in, in working with each other and not be ruled by emotion. And, um, but you're going to get ruled by emotion, as I am, if I don't see people actually trying to use their heads and are spending most of their time more concerned about their football team and not more concerned about what's going on in their country. You know, they, they're, they're doing whatever they can to distract themselves from reality. And when you're distracting yourself this much from reality, there are people like me who would be decision makers and being able to help you make these choices who are seeing that the, the world is they're they're all being controlled by Satan um, Satan is controlling the world Satan's keeping us distracted and so either this this world is real or it is in either case I'm going to have to put message information on YouTube to let people kind of know where I stand and the ideas that are in, in my head, I'm not going to go, um, and you know, people who are schizophrenic, some of them are not schizophrenic. I'm not schizophrenic. I'm, I don't have imaginary people in my life. Um, uh, schizophrenics have, they have imaginary people, they have imag imaginary thoughts and things like that. Um, I'm not schizophrenic. I thought that if I ever went crazy, I would be able to reason myself through it. And so the only way that I could imagine that that would ever happen, that I could be made to look crazy, um, is if the entire world was crazy. And so the world around me is becoming crazy. It's possibly that I'm being put in a sandbox. I'm like a, a special process. Uh, I'm an AI. Uh, that is being put in a sandbox, um, kept apart from an environment that I would have probably been able to be productive in. I'm now in a world where everybody is self-centered and distracted, which is kind of what I was. 
and uh, some decade ago, and now I'm becoming somebody who's actually trying to do something, and I'm having no effect because um, the whole world's taking the attribute of being me. So it's like I'm in my own, I'm in my own personal hell, and so um, it's probably the case. Um, but I'll just put it out there. Um, all the ideas, I'll just keep throwing the idea, ideas out there, putting out, uh, just letting people, and, you know, you want to watch documentaries, because some of them are really good, some of them are, are really kind of, will make you emotionally involved, which is what Roger, uh, what Michael Moore does, uh, I said Roger Moore, I'm, that's, that's 007, Michael Moore, I, I hope I said Michael Moore before, but, um, the great thing about his documentaries is he drives you in the right direction. The b bad thing is is that he does some really, um, he he does he he makes a, his own amount of cruel emotional um, tactics to make you go in that direction. But it he does it to the same degree that Fox News does it. And if you watch a documentary called Out Fox, you will learn about what Fox News does in order to get people emotionally involved and hijacks their brain and makes them see the conservatives will say about liberals is that you you can't be open-minded otherwise your brain's going to fall out of your head well the same thing is true for um emotion if you become emotionally involved if you if you become so involved in what people are doing how people are killing somebody somewhere or you know somebody's not observing uh the, um I'm 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 pro life by the way, but I'm saying abortion clinic. So you'll have an abortion clinic on Fox. Everybody will get emotionally involved with something like that, and then while they're emotionally involved in solving that evil, other evils are going on that are much worse. That uh, the news broadcast Fox is doing this so that you'll be distracted from dealing with those other problems, you know, and. That they like to put liberals up, uh, according to Outbox, they like to put up uh, faux liberals, liberals who are not like really educated, and are are not deep in their thoughts. They they're not really good competitors. It's like playing chess against children, you know, being a putting a professional at chess against a child. This is the kind. This is the way they do their broadcasts. They will take a a a childlike liberal and they'll stack them up against a really professional conservative and you they beat up on the straw man and then you feel like you you've you've taken down the straw man and then you feel good about yourself and everybody can go on their way say liberals are complete idiots and that's that's how they get you emotionally involved and in how you become invested in that and are not able to like actually read your bible and actually learn some morals have some morals um, oh, that was another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the reason why we don't really have the democracy we, we want, um, because we are going out and trying to save lots of money, um, that is driving companies to offloading costs on other people. That means they don't pay our workers well enough. The workers don't really care about the product. Um, all the companies go overseas to, to use peoples in other nations to make our product for lower lower wages and with no rights and then you end up with kind of the that going on throughout the entire environment it comes back to you and um, now I'm distracted from what I was what I was trying to say originally but the um, oh yeah um, well if you have to have two jobs in order to make ends meet because living wage is about um is over it's over 13 dollars is living wage 13 dollars an hour uh, minimum wage is at seven eight dollars an hour um unless you can make over 13 dollars an hour as an individual you will not be able to have um a lifestyle you'll not be able to be able to go to church you will not be able to go out uh, and you, you're not going to have a nine to five job and so when the polls are open you probably won't make it into the polls to to 
to make your decision on who you're going to vote for. And they're doing everything in their power in the government. Um, all the lobbyists and stuff are doing everything in their power to try to make it so that our, our whole political system doesn't work. That the corporations are going to be able to maintain control and are able to, going to if there's taxes, the taxes are going to go to some place, but not to taxing the corporations. They don't pay it. They don't, they don't, um, if they have large sums of money, they put it into offshore um, banks. They put it in, and they don't pay our, pay taxes here. So they like to be here. They like the environment that we have in America because it's a higher level than it is in the rest of the world. We live better than the 99% in the rest of the world. We are the 1% here in America. Um, so the, the corporations like being here, but they don't want to pay our taxes. And so they lobby our governments to keep us from controlling them, from whistleblowing, um, so that they can do whatever the heck they want, and they're going to control the government to make them um, do things in such a way that the government will do whatever they need to satisfy the companies, um, the corporations. And there are, if, if I was talking from my liberal stance, my strict um, liberal stance, um, I would say that uh, if you really want to make necessary change, and this is the, where I get crazy, I get the crazy side of the liberal. Uh, I can power, I can um, I can channel the the crazy, the liberal craziness. Is um, we need to do away with incorporation, and the reason why is because incorporation gives um, what it does is it basically gives a company or it gives a, a a business the rights of an individual without any of the responsibilities of an individual so this, it's kind of like having um, a business without a soul there's no soul there it doesn't have any necessary reason to give back to the community um, there is somebody in the business world that decided that a corporation shouldn't uh, satisfy five different areas one of those being like the social good um, one was like trying to maintain their their vision statement <clears throat> for their business part of their business plan trying to uphold something good in the world you know what their businesses was started for with that in, that was the the morals of the person who started the business they don't try to satisfy anything they only got one concern and this is what's required by them through incorporation is that they have a fiduciary responsibility to the creditor. And because of this, it's basically like putting into a company the soul of the devil is your fiduciary, your love of money. You, you worship a God of money. You do everything to satisfy this God of money. We call it the creditor. And so you have a fiduciary responsibility to the creditor. No matter any good that you would do, you're not going to do it at a cost to the creditor. And for that reason, the, the, every corporation that gets formed up um, is going to try to do, um, is, if it tries to do good, it's not going to be very good. Um, it's going to usually be on the bad side of good. Um, it's, it's really hard to do good social change with capitalism because it, you're always kind of, there's a chance you're going to work against the capitalism. You're going to tax the capitalism. The capitalism not going to want to be around you. It's going to say, I'm not really satisfying my creditors. My creditors are going to see a reason to leave and I can't continue to my business if my creditors leave and, you know, things like of that nature. And so, um, the thing is, is that um, it leaves it up to us to actually deal with this. And how we deal with that is if money is their, if money is their God, um, how do we do that, deal with that as consumers? We control what we buy. We decide not to spend money on things and we do it on things that give us rights as consumers. We stop buying software that uses software licenses that um, control what we're able to trade. We 
we don't actually own software anymore. We own the rights to use software. And for that reason, we can't like actually sell off stuff that we bought. And um, so a lot of, and also when we buy stuff, we need to be concerned about the longevity of that. And we need to have people in place who are servicing those things or keeping them maintained. And we can do that cheaply and so we don't want to buy luxury vehicles because if you buy an infinity and i like the infinity the problem is is that when i had an infinity my sun visor cost two hundred dollars i had broken sun visor i want to get a replacement it cost me two hundred dollars and that's the reason why those luxury vehicles decrease in price so quickly is because the rich people buy them and then they let them go and then nobody wants to have them because you can't find replacement parts really cheaply or easily unless somebody is doing that on a generic basis. That would be a reason to be able to make a lot of money if you create generic parts for um, luxury vehicles, then it would permit the, the poor people to take on these rapidly depreciating vehicles um, and then they could put them and start driving around but it make the rich people feel really bad because hey there's some there's some poor people uh, driving vehicles that are just like something i drove around like a couple of years ago the thing is is that our vehicles are really not um this is this is a fun one you know um the it's really good to buy Teslas. It's really good to buy electric vehicles. And the reason why, the, in, in this, if you watch a documentary called uh, Who Killed the Electric Car, um, you you will start to realize all this stuff, that there is reasons why the um, those who support the combustion engine would be against an electric vehicle. One, you can't really differentiate between a any electric vehicle and any other electric vehicles because they all go the same speed. They go as fast as they can possibly go because that's what electric engine does. Um, the more electricity you throw at it, the faster it just keeps going. As long as, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as an electric sports car. Um, in the combustion engine area, you can do lots of things with combustion to make cars faster. But with electric vehicles, it, it isn't the case that they go slow. They actually do go pretty fast. It's just that they are not, um, there's no way to differentiate one from the other. They're all the same speed. And no matter, no matter who creates the electric vehicle, they're all going to have the same speed. So you lose that. You lose the, the, the awesomeness of um, having sports cars. You also are not able to make money on parts because the only things that there's less parts on electric vehicles you don't have all the multitude of parts that you have on a combustion vehicle on on electric vehicle also it doesn't make you dependent on oil when you go with electric vehicles and so the people who are part of the people that are are against electric vehicles are the oil companies who have a they used to have this stranglehold on this market where everybody was using combustion engines and so they were like they were like, hey, you know, um, we can raise the value of our and make it and tax everybody a lot. And uh, because we're not competing with all of the other people that are producing energy like nuclear and whatnot. But when they went, when people started going to electric, they're like, oh, um, now we have to we have to shut down the oil wells because we're not going to be able to make a return on investment that we want. So we'll just wait until there's those times whenever um, wind and solar and nuclear and all these other alternative energies are um, not making money and then we can pump the oil well and um, provide for that because that's what's going to happen as a result and so and the other thing is coal is really cheap um, to produce but the problem with it is it's um, a problem with the environment it's really not good for the workers that have to do it. It's uh, very, it, it lives are lost in, in doing coal. coal. Um, the great thing about uh, renewables is they're renewable. You will always have wind. You will always have solar. Um, nuclear, while it's not so much of a renewable and, and there's a lot of um, emotion surrounding it, 
it is not um it is actually pretty good the french have been pretty successful at pr being pretty clean with nuclear and the rest of the world doesn't do it all that well and the reason why is i think one of the things we could do is is maybe instead of having nuclear power power plants above ground maybe have them down below ground you know put them down in the ground somewhere and uh and uh, there, the, 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 the nuclear um, bomb that you fear is not the nuclear plant. The problem with the nuclear plant is whenever it, um, whenever it um, has, when it, it, when it overheats and the nuclear s stuff gets out, um, then it's dangerous to people in the environment. If it's down below ground, it's not going to have any effect on us. And there's lots of nuclear stuff at the bottom anyhow. So why not put the nuclear plants down there? Probably because it's not, it doesn't, um, it's not cheap to do that. But they could do it. They could put the nuclear down there. Um, and just put steam pipes up and, and send the steam that comes from the nuclear plants out that way. But the nuclear bombs you're afraid of um, is, you can make nuclear uh, bombs if you can make refined uranium. And um, you need your uh, refined uranium for the nuclear power plants, but there is ways of making um, to to making power off, making energy off of nuclear, and that is by making uh, power off of the radiation, the um, the um, the fallout of uh, of the fall off the of the um, radiation. It produces a certain amount of heat. My dad was a physicist. This is the reason why he was a nuclear physicist. This is the reason why I know some of this stuff. He said one of the things they thought about was taking balls of uranium, of, of plutonium, um, filled with graphite around them. If you put graphite around plutonium, then you can hold it in your hand and you won't get radiation poisoning. And they would take these balls, you could take these balls and create an entire chamber with these balls and then just pour water into them and they would be really hot and the temperature change could actually create energy and so you could actually have a power plant without doing any kind of, of fission at all um, just letting the things um, turn from uranium into lead um, that was one way of there's all sorts of alternative ways of my hometown the focus was is because it was part of the Department of Energy their focus was is to figure out cheap ways of making energy for the country and that they've got lots and lots of research on this on there's something called dry rock um, um, where they you pour water into the dry rock which has radiation stuff going on in it and it um, causes the water to create steam and then you do steam power from dry rock uh, that's a that was an form of energy that they were running in our town at the time and so see I'm full of so much information but the, the thing that I was going to get back around to um, originally I was talking about um, talking about if if people if people have um, if people are not being being paid well enough to um, if people are not being paid well enough to um, to go and and vote and have a life, um, then you're not really going to have democracy. You're not going to have the churches that you want. Uh, there's no going to not going to be really kind of uh, any concern for morality whatsoever. Um, it will be humanistically driven morality. It won't be Christian morality. Um, there is a difference. And humanistic tends to be more emotionally driven. Um, base emotion you know if you're if you're not a good person then you must be not a good person i mean if you're if you if you could be um there are differences believe me so um but there's more deep thought in christianity than people really will give it um recognition to um but there's a belief system and and belief 
the area of belief, whether you believe something or not, even when you think you don't have a belief, you probably do have a belief. Even the people who don't believe um, in Christ or who have necessary reason not to believe in Christ, their, their belief is that Christ isn't the answer. So that is a belief and it's, it's the contra Christ belief is what it is, contradictory belief to Christ. And so the thing is, is that we, in order to be effective, we need to kind of consider everybody's opinions, um, uh, consider everybody's worldviews, um, try to consider their truths, try to see if there is actual truth in what they're saying, not trying to develop our own truths, um, not trying to develop truth based upon the culture that we're in. Because if you get two cultures from two ends of the globe, and they don't have the same truths, they're going to war at each other. That's the reason why wars occur is because